Hi, this is the fellow passenger. What you just heard was made by User Friendly, a very interesting artist based in Maryland, USA. The process of making somewhat more experimental electronic music can feel both enigmatic and somewhat opaque. So now I'm embarking on a mission to speak to artists that I'm curious about to hear their story on how they work. It's a real privilege that User Friendly has agreed to chat to me today. If you haven't already, you should definitely go and listen to his music. You will find it on Spotify, Bandcamp, and you should also definitely check out his beautifully curated Instagram and YouTube channel. You will find his link tree in the description below. User Friendly recently released the album APF7U on the label Detroit Underground. It's a compressed, chaotic and incredibly detailed network of sounds that I've been binging on recently. We will be talking background, process, inspiration, artists and equipment. I really hope you enjoy this chat. But before we start, if you would like to support this channel, make sure you check out the support links in the description below. And remember to like and subscribe for more future content. Okay, make sure you buckle up. Here we go. Hi, user friendly. Hello. How are you doing? Doing well. And yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Is it sunny in Maryland? No, it's very dreary today, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> it looks very dark in your studio. <laughs> um, so you have released recently released the album APF Seven U on Detroit Underground. Yep, I have been binging on that album recently, and it's generally been something that I've put on when I've been doing other things. And it's difficult to say like, oh, that's that track or, or, or that's that. But it's something that I've just put on again and again and again. And it puzzles me, but I'm also super excited about it. So I'm really pleased to talk to you about it and hear a little bit more how how that came to be. But just as a little bit of background to start with, where do you come from musically, so to say? What made you start making music? Uh, so I my sort of very early beginnings were just sort of climbing up onto a piano bench as a, you know, I don't know, I guess I was probably four or five years old and uh, just sort of smacking away at the keys and slowly sort of you know, started to figure out, oh, if I press these three keys, that sounds good. And sort of taught myself a little bit that way. Well, once my parents kind of took notice that I was, you know, playing regularly and sort of figuring it out for myself, they uh, decided to get me piano lessons. Um, and I, I, the idea was for, you know, full on piano lessons where I would learn to read sheet music and everything else like that. But I, I just didn't have the sort of focus or patience or anything. And my piano teacher, she was wonderful and, and really nice about it. So she was like, all right, well, if you're not interested in learning to read, what do you want to do with the lessons? And I essentially just, it got to a point where she would just teach me how to play certain songs. So like the, you know, last one that I learned before I stopped taking piano lessons was the Maple Leaf Rag by Scott Joplin. Mm. And after learning that, it's almost like I got stuck right there, like playing that sort of, you know, rhythmic ragtime sort of piano music. What sort, um, of, age, what sort of age was that? 12? Somewhere in there? Yeah. 11, 12. 
Um, and then from there, I, I kind of stopped doing the piano lessons and got really into composing piano pieces. And uh, I come from a, a larger family, so it's kind of difficult to constantly be hearing a, a poorly played piano in the background. So I ended up talking my parents into buying me a Yamaha CVP 301, which is sort of one of those workstation pianos. The main reason I wanted it is because it was, you know, large like a piano. It had the weighted keys and and it sounded really good. Um, but I slowly started to figure out that, you know, you could record a drum beat into this thing and then a bass line and there was some MIDI functionality and things like that. I mean, it's actually a really powerful keyboard. I never dove that deep into it, but that sort of led me to find out, oh, you can make music on a computer. And uh, I think I started with just a free version of Cubase. And then from there, Ableton 8 would have been where I got... I w Once I got Ableton 8, that was probably... I guess I was nineteen. What sort of what sort of music influenced you at that time when you started using Ableton and things like that? Uh, this is super funny. Owl City. Yes. So Owl City, when I heard that, um I guess I was probably seventeen or eighteen when I heard that. And listening to it, something about it, it was like I knew just enough about how electronic music was made and knew enough about like composing music. When I heard it, I was like, I can do that. This seems like it's really popular. I can make that kind of music. And that's when I got Ableton and kind of started playing with it and quickly found out, oh, I, I cannot do that. That's <laughs> very difficult. But that was it, weirdly enough, which I didn't Did you say it was so Alt City? I don't know if I know it. Do I know it? Mm, I'll look it up. I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'll put some. Uh, links I think he was, he was. Let's share some links in the description so people who are watching they can they can indulge. Certainly, certainly, there's several people watching this that are kind of laughing at the idea that <laughs> where I am now was was kind of sparked by Al City. That's it's definitely a little weird, but um, I was also really big into you know classical music and things like that growing up my my mother always she, she was definitely really you know definitely a big influence as far as like you know pushing different sorts of music and things like that but um philip glass uh oh, all right yeah and uh, who else would I say? actually um theater like cinema music was also a really big part of my musical diet growing up. So it was quite contemporary classical. Was it sort of Steve Reich and things like that as well? And yeah, yeah Steve Reich was was one of the ones where as a young kid it was, you know, especially in my teens, I really wanted to like Steve Reich. Like because it seemed so highbrow and, you know, everything else like that. But I never really fully could wrap my head around it until much later that I kind of started to really appreciate Steve Wright, you know, for you know the sort of things he was doing. John Cage was also another, um, his prepared piano stuff I always found really, really interesting. And did so, you have, like, was it your friends and things who were influencing you in terms of this type of music or was it generally the family background? Generally the family, actually. Um, and I don't necessarily come from a, a, a musical family or anything like that, but uh, so that's that's actually another important part of it is after fifth grade, um, I was actually homeschooled after that. My parents sort of gave us the option, you know, do you want to kind of continue with, so I, w I went to private school for um, the first, you know, little while of my education and I'm from a family of nine so there's a lot of us and my parents were kind of like you got you guys can either go to public school or you can be homeschooled it's sort of up to you and we opted to be homeschooled from there on out um, so I think that was also actually a 
pretty big part of my influence just because I, I wasn't going to school and listening to what everybody else was listening to or anything like that. It was sort of just whatever whatever I found or liked or whatever else like that. So, yeah. So how was then the path from that side of contemporary classical, you're having this workstation and you're composing piano pieces to something like your latest album, which is quite experimental, quite aggressive, very electronic. Um, I would say, I wonder how old I was. When I was, um, I, I, I really didn't, I, you know, I had, I obviously had friends, you know, growing up, but it was a very tight group of friends. And it was I wasn't really part of the party crowd or anything like that. We were much sort of much more sort of like, you know, five or six of us just sort of hanging out, you know, in parking lots or playgrounds, just kind of like talking and, and hanging out and things like that. But one of the few parties I went to um later in my teens, I heard dubstep for the first time. And I'm 90% sure the first dubstep song I ever heard was Factory by Downlink. And that was definitely a sort of like, whoa, what is this? I've never heard anything quite like this before. Um, and I think that was something that sort of kind of grew in the background for quite a while, just that sort of more harsh robotic sort of sound um but i would say most of what sort of inspired me to get into the more experimental stuff was actually the equipment itself you know just in the process of you know learning about modular learning about you know different techniques in ableton you just kind of end up getting exposed to you know people like richard divine or tom hall you know th those sorts of artists sarah bell reed um sort of through the hardware you find those people and then that sort of grows into all of this different stuff that he'd never heard of before but i can totally see i was listening to your album from uh, 2020 and you can s sort of hear under all the sound that there really are some dubstep influences there but it's feels much more interesting to me because it's very sort of deconstructed and it's not just a banger for the dance floor it's something like way more complicated than that and i find that super fascinating i don't know maybe there is in your latest album it feels like maybe there are there's something about the snares that feels like they perhaps have their origins in that world somewhere that's that's sort of how it came across to me so how how do you see that development like what you when i listen to your latest album i don't necessarily think of like oh this is i would never label it as dubstep like how how did you end up in this place and what was the process of putting this album together um it's, it's really funny that this is kind of i was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday about this how it's weird because i don't really think my music sounds very much at all like actual dubstep but it almost has to have the the dubstep tag because there is so you can hear it throughout like i was certainly influenced by it but um as far as the snares that's always been like um a, a big thing for me so like as the sound design gets crazier and crazier i think it becomes more and more important to have very sort of rock solid things that you can sort of hold on to while you're getting thrown around by all this other stuff so making sure that the kick is really coming through and the snare is really coming through kind of gives you something to sort of to sort of hold on to as far as how the um album was made it's essentially just the the, the same sort of process that i've been doing for the past um year or two now which is just you know taking all of these different random recordings whether it be modular or just noodling around on something you know we all have these huge 
libraries of things that we've recorded and never done anything with, um, I sort of kind of had this idea like, I'll, I have all this stuff. I know I'm never going to release it. I should make use of it. So I sort of, you know, just have a few different techniques where I can kind of take everything, dump it into a big pot, mix it all up, and then just kind of cut out little sections of it. Um, so is it a product of like much longer recordings and you find the bits that excites you and you pick them out? Is that a fair assumption? Sort of, sort of. Um, it's more, it, it doesn't necessarily even have to be a, a long recording. It could just be a 45 or 50 second little recording. But the way that I do it, it won't just be one recording like that. It'll usually be multiple different things that sort of tonally are, you know, all in the same family, but not all the exact same. And I make essentially an instrument rack in Ableton, put each one of those into a simpler or a sampler, and then using random LFOs or something like that, I'll sort of change where the start point is of each sample that I put in there, but then also have things built into where those samples are randomly being chosen from. So it'll be a random slice of a random sample. And all of this is done through MIDI. So I'll set up on a grid, you know, a bunch of different little MIDI one shots. Each time one of those MIDI notes is triggered, it's going to select a random start point from a random sample. I'll record that whole chain and then take that entire chain of all these random little slices and put that into the Euro rack. So what I'm left with is not necessarily something that's been curated. Like I don't meticulously go through and say, I want this piece. I want this piece. It's just too con time consuming and it's too boring. <laughs> is it also so I, like it's 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 almost like being a lion tamer. You sort of like it's sort of warts and all, and you just like get lots of stuff. There might be some dangerous things in there, but you just like I'll chuck it into the euro rack. Is that what's happening? Uh, exactly. And and I've actually mentioned this before in one of my YouTube videos or something, where when I'm working with the euro rack, I'm more sort of looking for sounds than I am actually you know, saying, okay, I want this sound and then I want this sound. It's sort of like, I'm just sort of going through these long sample chains and saying this slice, this slice, and this slice, they seem to all sort of form this rhythm. And then I can either construct a drum beat around that or do it the other way around. I'll set up a drum beat and then try and find these sample slices that'll sort of work with the rhythm. Ah, so you would say the bit that you do in Ableton is far more randomized. And then when you then you use all that as the building material, but when you put that into the Euro rack, you may be searching, but then you're more deliberate and saying like, you don't necessarily just do random selection through everything. That's more just you pick out the bits that are going to work together. Yes. It's, it's a, a, largely about having a, a, a you know, a huge volume of sound to sort of sift through and find what works. And, you know, once I am, you know, in the Eurorack, I will use randomness to some extent, but it it can't be all random because the sound library that I'm working with is so big. If it were just, it would just be chaos, which that can sound really cool depending on how you tame it. But for the most part, it'll be, you know, this sort of sounds like, it could be where the kick should be and then the snare should be here. So this sound works well with that. Um, yeah. I don't know if that, is that a good? Yes. Yeah. Make sense? I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. So, but there's one thing that is puzzling then because it feels when I listen to it, like, yes, it's chaotic music, but it also sounds really pronounced. It's almost like a photograph with really nice high contrast, like things are sort of popping out nicely. You were saying about the snare and the kick. Like, how does that work when you work with so much sort of random material? Is there, 
once you have a piece or, 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 or something going that you like, is there a lot of work to then make the right things pop out and the things that are, you know, not so pleasing to make them disappear a bit? I think everything is so heavily compressed that it's just going to sort of, you know, I'll make sure that the snare is so loud that it's going to shove everything else down. So that's the other, that's actually a big reason that um, most of the time I do stereo out recordings of the Euro rack because then that signal flow is actually sort of for this particular sound, it's doing the mixing for me because, you know, if if I know that the snare is this loud, it's just going to shove everything else out of the way. So it's it's going to come through just because it's that loud. Um, APF7U, I actually did do, that was multi-track to an extent, um, but more in that the kick was recorded separately, the effects were recorded separately, and so one, two, three, four. I think it was the kick snare, other percussion, then effects, and everything else. So it was more kind of stemmed out rather than multi tracked. Um, I would also say to our listeners and viewers that user friendly has got some really good videos where he shows how he's using his equipment, but it would be good to touch upon. We talked a little bit about, it sounds like the preparation work is happening in Ableton and then you step into the hardware world to then actually complete the piece. And do you do, I assume when you say heavily compressed, does the compression happen hardware wise as well? Or is that happening? Like you, you do a stereo into Ableton and then you process it using software. It's just always happening. <laughs> Compression is always happening almost at every stage. So when <laughs> when I, when I were, <laughs> and, uh, no, I really don't. It's I, my favorite compressor of all time is the drum bus in Ableton. Almost anything that you hear from me will have a drum bus on it. Um, so individual channels I, and the 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 like. So when I when I do the sample prep, ninety percent of the time, it will be finished off with a drum bus. So it's compressed once there. Then once it goes into the Euro rack, um, I'll sometimes use a limiter in the ER three hundred one, but not always. Usually it's just kind of left as it is. Maybe a little bit of EQ here and there in the three hundred one, and then the entire mix goes through the WMD muscle. And so there, there's an, another layer of compression. Then it, most of the time my stuff goes through the analog heat. And then from the analog heat goes back into Ableton. So the analog heat isn't, it's obviously not a compressor, but saturation is to some extent doing some compression. Mm -hmm. And then once it gets into Ableton, it'll go through drum bus again. <laughs> so it's definitely layer and layer, you know, layers and layers and layers of compressors. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's sort of like, you know, how you hear people say, you know, use, use multiple compressors, just doing a little bit of compression on each one. I would like to say that I'm, you know, sort of that meticulous, but I'm really not like, you know, there's not really even a you, know, you can't control how much compression drum bus does anyway, but either way, everything is constantly being crushed. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the work with uh, Detroit Underground work? As in, when I understand that they reached out to you and wanted you to make mm -hmm. an album for them, did they, did they have a sort of a say about what you were doing or w were you quite free to make something that you enjoyed? No, they were they were kind of just like you know they, I think they had initially found my sort of sound through Instagram, um, and that was sort of like the you know the prompt of you know do you think you could do an album that sort of sounds like the stuff you're you're doing? I, I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, my sound is it's pretty much always more or less the same thing. You know, it, it's not that varied. So I think it's, you know, kind of one of those things where if you're asking me for an album, you 
you guess know what pretty you're well get. what it's going to get. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, that's nice. So, so did they do, did they provide any, when you sent it to them, did, did you provide the artwork and did the mastering and everything, or did they take care of some of that? They took care of that. So I um, assumed they would want me to do the artwork. And so I did make some artwork with um, Max. And, you know, once I sent them the album and sent them the artwork, they were like, no, we'll, we'll take care of the artwork in the house. Um, just so that way they can sort of keep everything uh, you know, on brand or whatever they might exactly. call Exactly. And then they did the, the mastering in the house as well. So, which I was... A little bit disappointed. I was hoping. I've I've always used um, Nathan Moody, so I was excited to have another opportunity to have him master something. But once they said they would take care of it, yeah. Oh well. It's not, I mean, they've done a good job. I mean, to my ears, yeah. anyway. <laughs> so, in, so in terms of the um, the hardware, I, I was wondering: is there a relationship between the name of the album and the hardware? I, I I can't remember which Eurorack case you have, but is the seven U a reference to your Eurorack case? Uh, no, and I I almost uh, didn't name it what I named it because of that because I was thinking, well, that's sort of seven U. But um, is there a mystery to the name and the track titles, which are on numbers? And I think there's one of them that has a decimal in it, and they are not in numerical order. Like, what is there anything that you can reveal about? That mystery yes it's very a very deep puzzle so apf7u is a project for detroit underground oh I <laughs> the, see. the seven looks like a d to me so i put the seven there so it wasn't just eu <laughs> and then each one of the tracks is just called that because as i would like this it's essentially named as I saved it in the in in the computer. So I just sort of a project for Detroit Modular saved in there as that. And then the numbers are just the original order in which they were made. So three point five was the second take of oh, see. a track that I recorded. So no, no deep mystery or puzzle there. There we are. That's that's the secret. <laughs> pure, key. pure laziness. <laughs> but then, um, so, so after they reached out to you and said, like, okay, do you want to do an album? And I assume you said, like, yes, that would be amazing. How long was that journey from you starting making it until you had completed it, as when you were ready to hand it over to them? How long did that process take? A um, couple of weeks. Not really, not very long at all, because. Um, like everything is done on like most of the work is, is already done. So I already have this huge, you know, all of these sample chains and this huge sample library to choose from, um, that I kind of just picked what, what sounded good. One of the, um, big sample chains that's, that's used throughout the album. It was actually a feedback patch that I did on the Octa track which I really can't remember exactly what the heck I was doing, but um, I want to say I was sending things out of the Octatrack through a mixer and some distortion and then back into the Octatrack and doing some sort of feedback thing and then chop that up into Ableton and a lot of the sounds throughout the album, you know, are, are that sort of thing. But as far as like... It's it, once I had, you know, kind of the first track done, it was, you know, sort of like, okay, now just generally sort of follow that using, you know, these. Sand. So each one of the tracks has a couple different sample chains. But again, like I've said, since the sample chains are so large i can kind of reuse them over and over again and and find different different results so like um the 3.5 track the second take with that literally all i did was leave the sequence in the nerd sec the same everything stayed the exact same i just swapped the sample chains from the original take that i had done because i, I didn't really like it that much and rather than just scratch the whole track, I said, well, let me just change two or three of these sample chains and 
voila, you have a, a new track. So you can't, I can't really do that. I can't do that just, you know, like I, you, you, you can't really do that for an entire album. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't write, you know, out the sequences on the nerd sec and then just change the samples out for each track because the percussion is sort of baked into those samples. So since the sequence is kind of written for those samples, if you change the samples out, the original rhythms that you had won't be there anymore because those rhythms were designed for, you know, the dynamics of of those particular samples, if that makes sense. But yeah. Also the equipment that you're using, I'm sort of looking at on your Instagram. So anyway, everyone, you should go and check it out because it's, yeah, it, it, it looks super professional and laid out, but I, I noticed the, uh, there is a bunch of electron boxes uh, you got, and then you have a Eurorack setup. Is that your sort of go to? If you just want to give a little brief overview of what the sort of type type of kit, we don't need to know every model in the Eurorack, but is that roughly a, a fair assumption of what you're using? Plus Ableton on the computer. Yeah, the Ableton. Um, I'm not necessarily using that for any sort of. Um, I'm I'm working on a few tracks right now that are done completely in Ableton, but um, that's kind of like a separate sort of project. I have trouble using Ableton and hardware together. It doesn't work for me because it's it. I just always end up being like, well, I'll just use Ableton for everything. <laughs> Ableton is better than hardware. <laughs> So I generally keep those separate aside from the sort of sample prep, but um, I think, yeah, the, the best thing would be to say that I have a modular system and electron boxes that would kind of more or less give, you know, everything that I, that I have. Um, I also have a, a Nord drum 3P that I use as well from time to time. Um, if you would but, give a, a shout out, like uh, out of even if it's an individual module or one of the electron boxes, what would you say? Not ne in necessarily a particular order, but like your top three pieces of equipment that you feel super inspiring and feel like I'm never going to let these go. Like what what are they? What are your favorite pieces? Your tools? It could be software as well, I suppose. Um, I would say the. For a while now, I've been convinced that the analog rhythm was my favorite electron box. The more I play with it, I think the analog four is possibly starting to take that over just because it's it's such a traditional sort of way to, you know, it's a synthesizer. Mm. There's no samples, there's no, you know, it's that's what you you have you have to work from the ground up with these oscillators to sort of create sounds. And so I, I think right now that's probably my favorite. Um in the Eurorack, um my favorite module for quite a long time has been the herb verb. Uh I don't know why, it's just something about the way it sounds. The The tricky thing with the Eurorack system is it's all so like I, I kind of would have to say that in my case, my favorite module is the case because it's kind of been designed to the point where if you don't have one piece of it, it just doesn't really it doesn't work in the same way. So was it a bit um, of a process to find like this is it? Did you go through changes in the case? Uh, yeah. So I um actually started just you know the the same way everybody else does i got a mother 32 and that turned into a maths and mother 32 and then before i knew it i had a you know <laughs> 6u 84 hp case and that over time grew into a um six rows is that 18u 18U uh, 168. Yeah. Yeah. So it was 168 HP 18U case. So really big case. That's, um, I use that case to make my album Caught by the Tail. And after, that was sort of like my, I want to make an entire album using the, being 
pure Eurorack, which that's sort of what that album was. After making that, I kind of had trouble being inspired by it because it was almost like, all right, I've I've done the the big Eurorack thing, and I sort of broke that down, kept a few modules, and just um, played around with a few different setups here and there, and then. Um, I wouldn't say that this was uh, like a meticulously, you know, I slowly had this idea and kind of built it up and built it up. It was sort of just like, oh, this sort of works and this sort of works. And all of a sudden it was like, I had the case, you know, where it was. The, the biggest part of it is the 301 and the nerd sec. After that, it's just two effects, the morphogene and the assimilator. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it was like a sort of, you know, slow process of, you know, it was kind of trial and error, if I'm honest. And, and, and now it's just at the point where if I, if I try to change anything, if I try to switch anything out, the whole thing just kind of falls apart and doesn't, doesn't work as well. Like I, I, I tried at one point adding the, um, IO labs flux sequencer to kind of do the percussion side of thing. And. I think it's just one of those things where right now the case is kind of at the, you know, the threshold of complexity, you know, where if you try to add one more thing, it just, it ends up being too much to keep track of. But it sounds like you have found your instrument and you're sort of mastering that now. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah I think, um, I wouldn't really consider my case as like a Eurorack case. I kind of consider it a tracker. like. It's basically just a tracker on steroids. It's not really, I, I just, I feel a little weird saying that it's, you know, a modular synth because I'm not patching, I'm not exploring, you know, what happens if I connect this module to this module. It's sort of like a designed instrument at this point. So yeah, I, I will say that I, I think I can, you know, say I've finished my case. This is the Eurorack case. And, you know, it, I've, I've finished and, it, it. and it is sort of, it's patched and, and, it's all set up so you can just start using it. Yes. Yep. And yep. Definitely a, a permanent sort of patch thing where, um, you know, if I want to clean it off or, you know, move something a little bit, I can pull the patch and put the patch back together without, you know, turning the case on or anything like that. That's why I can do the um, cable management because it's like I've, done this exact same patch over and over and over it's always the exact same sort of structure to it that's why i, I it feels wrong to say that it's a euro rack system because i'm not actually patching anymore <laughs> so, so that would be interesting to hear uh where you are going to move next like after this album but before we do that when we look at the album, are there any particular tracks that you feel more happy with? Like, are there any particular ones that stand out for you? Are there any ones where you feel like, oh gosh, you know, like, or, or any, was there anything that didn't make it onto the album that you sort of feel like, oh gosh, that was actually quite good in hindsight or anything? No, um, you kind of mentioned this at the beginning that when you listen to it, it, it it's sort of like you can't really pick anything out in particular or or like it almost sort of seems like one continuous thing that's sort of how i view it and it, it's almost like you're it's it's more just one long track than it is 10 separate tracks you know they're all basically the the same sort of thing so i, I wouldn't say that i have a favorite it's sort of just like a you know the project as a whole to me sort of more or less sounds the same I think it's that in itself is quite interesting because before downloading and Spotify and all that, if I would buy an album, the listening process would be different and I wouldn't sort of skip around like I do with a lot of music today. I listen to one thing and then I jump to something else. I listen to half that track and then I jump to something else again, where I feel like your album lends is very well to like it, it, it is a whole thing like yeah you, yeah it's 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 constructed as a piece and you take in the entire piece it's interesting i was talking to duncan about this just the other day um about your most recent album mm. 
the very, the very first track when I when I started listening to it, I was like, okay, this is going to be an Alltecker sort of inspired album. The very first track of it just that sounds very Alltecker to me. And I wouldn't at all say that I was let down. Like I like Alltecker sound. It was when the next track started that I really got hooked into the album because you made a very sort of there was an obvious shift like this sounds different like this is a new track this is a different sound and it's not just going to be that sort of continuous all tacker thing it seems to me like when you listen to all tacker you're not really listening to one song you're just listening to all tacker sort of like a continuation of their sound whereas your album it's sort of like each one there's there's some sort of distinct difference between each track I think it's I'm I'm not entirely sure that I I want I think I may want to start stepping in your direction where it's more like separate sort of actual pieces of music rather than that that continuation of things but I don't know I just I thought that was it's interesting that this came this this comes up just because your album recently coming out I was saying the exact mm. opposite to to Duncan about it that it's like there's separate songs you know which i think there's, there's, I, I, i've had different comments comments about it like that where someone was saying that oh it feels like quite sort of spread out and some of them are really cerebral and other ones are not but yes i i i, I still think like even regardless i just like the idea of being able to put an album together that feels like it should be listened to in its entirety you know like you you've curated something rather than just pulling it apart and just listening to that little bit and i think right. i admire that with yours and maybe those two things could be married because yes I, I think i see what you mean because i think each of the tracks have something recognizable to hold on to like a little melody or a bass line or a particular sound or something that you could do yeah i think it's something that's would be interesting in investigating a bit further. Yeah. I would like to know where where you are planning to go next musically. What's the future? I'm not I'm not sure. I've I've actually been working on a couple of Ableton tracks. Um I kind of got this, you know, wild hair where I was like, let me try to, you know, make something in Ableton. And I found a few different techniques that I've kind of been like exploring and it's doing that same sort of thing where it's giving me a way to sort of have this continuous sort of sound but add some variation in between um but i just i have a lot of trouble focusing in and sticking with the computer i think that's why hardware works so well for me is because i have something i can actually touch and interact with and it helps me stay focused so i don't um haven't been all that inspired by the your rack lately um i've been definitely sort of diving into the electron boxes but they're difficult for me to something about them it's difficult for for me to like actually write a continuous piece of music so i've thought about doing something with that you know doing you know an entire album you you know using just the analog rhythm or the analog four or the octatrack or something like that but for me those boxes are they're challenging to not noodle on which i think i just need i need more time with them because it's the same with your rack when you first start with your rack it's really difficult to not just noodle and you know sort of explore sounds it takes a while before you can actually create a you know, a piece of music on a Euro rack system. So I think I just need more time with the electron boxes. But I would my suspicion that as far as hardware stuff goes, that'll that'll probably be where I go next is, you know, Naming doing something down, with just like but do you yeah. will we see will we be seeing where will we be seeing and hearing this stuff? I'm sure there will be more Instagram. Will there be some more YouTube as well? Definitely. Um uh probably, you know tutorials here and there where I can find something interesting to talk about, but um, I don't really have any sort of direction, you know, as far as, you know, like creative ideas go or anything like, like the, in general, I lack direction. <laughs> so 
I'm sort of just exploring stuff and something will kind of either, you know, like this Detroit underground project was perfect for me because I didn't have anything that I was, you know, trying to do or anything like that. It really does help to have somebody sort of approach you and say, I need X, Y, or Z. Can you do that? Are you interested in doing that? Yes. You know, we, we've, we've talked about this before with, with Duncan where it's, you know, it's like having that sort of prompt or deadline seems to seems to help out, um, but in the meantime, I'll just kind of keep keep exploring and. There's no there's you know. no track in the pipeline that's going to pop out soon or anything like that. Mm, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. It'll. I'm, I'm still brewing some ideas. What about a last thing? Um, what about? an artist that you would like to recommend to listen to? It doesn't need to be the type of music that you do, but just something like for everyone listening and watching, like if they should go and listen to something, what what is in your, not right now, but what would be in your headphones? Um, definitely Two Hands is, is worth checking out. He's doing some really, really interesting stuff with um, Max. Um, I can't really think of anybody that's doing quite exactly what he's doing, but it's really, really interesting and definitely worth keeping an eye on. I, um, and then, uh, other than that, I don't know. Two hands has definitely, definitely been, uh, you know, an inspiration for me lately. The, that's fine. We'll put the link in the description so people yeah. can check it out. Yeah. I'm kind of been all all consumed by uh I, I I just in the past year or so have sort of really started to dive into all tecker. So for the most part, I've been like trying to work through their dis discography, which it's just so much that it's like that's where the majority of my I, my ears have been focused lately, but I don't think anybody needs that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> but can we just talk about this Orteca thing? I I, I think of a lot of Orteca's music as almost like penguins. <laughs> that when yeah. You, yeah. So like if they're if you're watching a, a nature program and you see penguins, they're really they're really like interesting to see, but it's difficult to tell them apart. And then I almost need a pause after a bit because it's like the novelty, like I just need a bit of an Ortega pause and then I can listen to it again. Sometimes actually counterintuitive to what we were saying earlier, if I hear an Ortega track in isolation away from the entire album, all of a sudden it can sort of pop out to me. Like if I listen to an entire album, it just becomes one long thing we were saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. The thing that I find interesting about that is you you kind of listen to them and it and it sounds like, yes, this is all tecker, yes, this is all tecker. But throughout that long period, there'll be these things that happen that are just these other like I've never heard a sound quite like that before. And they'll allow you to hear it for a little bit and then it's gone. And you never hear it again. And something about that sort of Easter egg hunting has been very fun to me, where it's almost like they have this huge collage of noise, and you almost have to be patient and sit there. Like it, it seems like, you know, bird watching or something, where it's like you're just kind of sitting there, don't see any, don't say, oh, look at that. That's really cool. And it's gone, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Could I, I, I was, we, I was in a small town close to here and there was an auction with some famous local painter who's now dead, but there was a picture that they were going to auction away, which was of this forest. And there was a lady there and says like, you know, if you watch long enough, you will start seeing all these animals in there. It was quite abstract. And I think it's maybe a little bit like that. Like the, you eventually stop picking those little things out like it's it's just like a, a noise to start with, but the longer you engage, and I, I think that's a bit with your album as well. Like you, it's like the animals are in there, you know. Like you'll stop picking yeah. it up when you listen to it for a bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This has been 
super interesting and thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your process a bit and really looking forward to hear what's going to happen what's going to come out of those electron boxes one day absolutely thank you very much for having me i appreciate it thank you